So this is all about testing um, new drugs and we're using the word drugs here to refer basically to medicines, okay? So where do, do new medicines come from? Well, people are constantly looking for uh, medicines that either work better, well usually it's they want something that works better than what we've already got, although they might be testing drugs to, to cure something we don't have a cure for yet. So they're constantly being tested, there's a huge amount of money in this, uh, it's a very, very expensive business. It costs millions and millions of pounds to create new drugs uh, because it takes so long and there's so many things to consider. There are three stages really. First stage is um, you would test on cells grown in a laboratory. So you might have these cells in a dish and you can test it by putting different amounts of your um, drug on there and seeing what happens. So you might be working out how much concentration the drugs you need. Do you need a big concentration to do something? Does it need a smaller concentration? And we can tell a few things from that um, and, and get the, the basic idea done. The second stage is the controversial one probably, which is animal tests. Now, <coughs> excuse me, before you're allowed to, to sell and market drugs uh, for humans, they have to be tested on animals first. Now, there are a lot of ethical issues about this. Um, some people would uh, disagree very strongly with it. Other people would agree that it is something that's very important. So you might get asked questions about the ethics um, of this. Is it right or wrong to do this? Um, they might do the tests on things like uh, rats, mice, for example, which are fairly easy to keep um, and, and breed quite quickly. They might test it on other animals that are a bit closer to humans. The very, very strict laws on um, regarding animal testing, you need all kinds of licenses. You have to make sure the animals are kept very, very, um, in very, very good conditions. Um, so it's not as, as simple as just you know, testing these things on any old animal you feel like. It's very, very carefully controlled. The last step, if by testing on these animals we've found that the drug is having either the effect we want or it's not being too harmful, Finally, we might get to uh, what we call either clinical trials or sometimes called human trials. Now, this the first two stages might take years, you know, four or five years to get to this stage or even more. By the time we get to here, we have to be pretty sure that the drug, the medicine we're testing, isn't going to cause massive side effects. There's always that risk. Um, but we need to be pretty sure that it's not going to cause big problems. If you are testing a drug for, I know something like an anti-cancer drug, it might be a different set of um, regulations you would follow. For example, if you were trying to test a drug that maybe extended people's life who had cancer, maybe by months or years, you might be a little bit more um, you might be prepared for those drugs to have more side effects because if you were testing a drug for say headaches you, you certainly wouldn't want things like um, really bad side effects and sickness and illness whereas if it was to try and prolong the life of um, somebody who you know had, had a very serious disease we might have a different slightly different approach not to say that we want um, side effects we certainly wouldn't but we might um, consider a slightly different approach to it so this would be done on um, human volunteers. Of course, if you were testing a drug for a particular disease, you would want your volunteers to actually have that disease. There's no point testing a drug um, for cancer, an anti-cancer drug, on patients who don't have cancer, for example. It's not going to show you anything. So the people who are chosen has to be chosen carefully. So when you're designing these clinical trials, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, number one, you, I'll tell you what, let's use letters here. Um, let's use a different colour as well. You really need to use a large number. This makes your results more reliable. If you only tested on a few people uh, and you got certain results back, how can you be sure that those results would um, work for the rest of the population? You have to try and do it with the largest number of people that's reasonably possible. You really need to control the test in some way. Now by this we might mean things like um, controlling for gender, um, controlling for age. So you might want to do a test on people between the ages of 15 and 50, for example. 
or you might just be looking at a specific age group, maybe 60 to 70. It depends on what the drug is. It might be important if it's male or female. It might be something that's important for, for example, smokers. So you might be testing something on a, a drug to help people stop smoking. It's no good testing it on a group of people who don't smoke anyway. So when we say control things here, you need to know what all these factors are. You can't control perhaps every single thing, but you need to control it as much as possible. You make a decision on what you need to test and how much you control the group. And step C, we really want to do some kind of randomizing of our data. And when we did the experiment in class with the Tic Tacs, remember we deliberately, or I didn't deliberately, did this incorrectly. I split you in groups and I said, right, this group are having this, this group are having that. And it wasn't random, it wasn't it wasn't really fair, was it? It was, um, the results I got back are biased because I picked the groups myself. So what we would do is, um, three versions of this really, what we did in class is called an open label trial. This is where everybody knows what they're getting and everyone knows what's supposed to happen. Now, those trials sometimes need to be done. Sometimes some drugs um, are done that way. For example, if it's an anti-cancer drug trial, you might well want to know what the, the drug is. You can also do a blind trial, blind test. And this is where the patient doesn't know what they're getting, so they don't know what the, the drug might do. Even better is a double blind trial, double blind test, it's called a trial, where not only do the patients not know, the doctor who gives them the drug doesn't know either. Somebody has to know, so somebody somewhere would have a record of what each drug was, but the person who was giving those drugs out wouldn't know what they were. This helps avoid what we call bias. It might be that the doctor who's, or the scientist giving the drug in the trial really wants it to work, so they might try and um, even without thinking about it, affect the results in some way by trying to make sure that they got the results they wanted. And doing a double blind trial um, really helps. So sometimes they're known as randomized um, controlled, double blind randomized controlled tests is one of the best ways to test medicines. Double blind because we get rid of some of the bias, randomized and controlled.